Hey everyone, I'm Eddie Joe. I'm an intensive care physician and I really felt the need to elaborate quite a bit on my thoughts regarding the vitamins trial which was published yesterday. Yesterday was January 17th, 2020. Today is Saturday, January 18th, 2020. And I'm actually sitting inside my car. This is my Mini Cooper. Funny thing, I took out my back seats to reduce weight and there's my jump rope. So now that that's being said, because I'm not at home, I'm actually at my in-laws house. Um, yesterday, the trial was published. I actually watched the live stream on the Critical Care Reviews site. If you're not logged into that newsletter, if you don't get it every Sunday or Monday that Rob McSweeney puts out, you're really missing out on a lot of fun. That's where I get a lot of my data. But I'm very disappointed in the results of the study, not because of the results themselves, but more so how they conducted the study. At the end of the day, I have to tip my hat to the researchers because they did the research. They conducted the study the way as hold on a second. My car just beeped at me. Um, they conducted the study the way they saw fit. Their endpoints were appropriate. Their secondary endpoints as well as primary endpoints, which ultimately showed no differences except for a reduction in the SOFA score. But whatever, I'm not going to elaborate on that. The results are valid for the study that they did. I don't have any qualms with that whatsoever. Um, I'm... I have qualms with how they actually did the study with regards to timing of the study drug. We know that giving patients antibiotics within the first hour of sepsis is instrumental to decreasing mortality. But the way this study was performed, this the expediency was not provided for the study drug. Let me tell you a little bit quickly before and I have my notes here on the side. Um, this is the way I take care of septic shock patients and the way I've been doing so for a couple of years and I'm continuously trying to get better at it. Usually, and I will say this, sorry, this is not medical advice with regards to how you should take care of your patients. This is my personal opinion. This is the way I do it in my practice and I'm just trying to do my best to take care of patients. I think I do a pretty good job. I do okay. And I'm continuously trying to learn. That's why I make these videos. That's why I read as much as I do. So the way that sepsis management goes when I get alerted of it, first of all, I get alerted by either the emergency medicine physician in the ED or a hospital medicine doctor who has a patient who's sick out in the wards or from a surgeon who is in the OR and they just had an intra-abdominal catastrophe and they want to let me know about the patient. The first thing I do is obviously I'm sitting in front of a computer. We have to use the power of our EMR as much as we may hate it. And we can learn a lot about the patient in a couple minutes. So as soon as I'm notified of the patient, I'm sitting in front of the computer, I ask for the medical record number, I pull the patient up. I immediately, while the, while the clinician is speaking to me, I'm scanning through for the source of sepsis. Why is this patient deteriorating at that moment? Is it intra-abdominal? Is it pneumonia, is it a UTI, is it cellulitis, is it neck fash? I'm trying to dig that out, trying to double check and verify the source that the clinician on the telephone is telling me. And at the same time, I am also digging into the EMR to find out what the underlying comorbidities of that patient are. An example of that being, you know, is does the patient have an ejection fraction of 10%? Does the patient have a history of uh, very resistant UTIs for which standard Venk and Zosin are not going to cut it for that patient. Uh, is the patient 450 years old? And in that case, rather than uh, digging first into resuscitating them aggressively, do I need to address code status with that patient? Those, those key elements are important and you can actually ascertain that information rather quickly from the EMR. Or another example is, does the patient have severe pulmonary hypertension? And if you go ahead and you start bashing this person with liter after liter of fluids, you might actually kill their RV. So I don't want to do that to these patients. And I looked that up. It takes me less than three minutes, guys. It's really not that long. And then as soon as I finish doing that, I go down and down or over to the wards and I assess the patient immediately. I trust my clinical judgment. Um, I trust my eyes. That's something that I give a lot of value to. And when I go eyeball a patient, I get a really rough estimate of what their fluid status is. And I'm telling you, there's no, no gold standard way to know what fluid status is, but I can at least do my best guesstimate. 
Then after I see the patient, I already know if I have to intubate them. I know if I have to place a line on them. I know how much fluid they've gotten. I either start giving more fluids or I start vasopressors early. And in my practice, I start vasopressors pretty darn early. Get them to the ICU, put an A line in them if they need it. And they're probably already on pressors and I establish an airway if they need it. Again, I can't get into every single caveat of my management in this video. You just have to accept that. Every patient is completely different. And then once they're on pressors, I figure out how quickly they're going up on their pressors. And again, this is happening within one hour of them being in my hands. It's, it's just challenging that you need to camp out next to that patient's bed. I am sitting in the nurse's station right across from the bed, laying eyes on that patient continuously, communicating with the bedside nurse continuously, seeing how quickly they're going up on their pressors. Um, I have them on some sort of hemodynamic monitoring device. At my institution, we use the EV-1000 by Edwards, which is what we have. And I do my best to correct this patient's volume status and fix what their SVR is, uh, titrate the pressures based on the cardiac index. I do my best with what I have. So once the patient goes over 10 mics of levofed, and I'm not going to get into straight dosing versus weight-based do dosing. I'll cover that on another day. Every institution is different. Once I go over 10 mics of levofed, then I start getting a little bit more worried about the patient because their press requirements keep on increasing. How quickly their press requirement increases kind of gives me an idea to some degree of what the source control is on the patient, whether I have them on the right antibiotics or Either way, I just don't get a good feeling inside. So at that point, I've built into the EMR a couple of orders, including vasopressin, stressful steroids at hydrocortisone, 50 milligrams IVQ, six hours, vitamin C, 1500 milligrams IVQ, six hours, and uh, thiamine, 200 milligrams IV, BID. And I just go ahead and I click off these three orders to do the metabolic resuscitation component of this. And I could... And I already have gone over it to some extent, but there's plenty more that I wish to elaborate on moving forward with regards to this therapy. But that's what I've been doing in my practice. And I keep on reassessing, reassessing, reassessing. It's important to note that all this is taking place within six hours of the patient reaching my ICU. And likely less than six hours from them presenting with sepsis altogether. So we move fast. The mortality rate of sepsis, depending on the study, is anywhere between 25 to 40 percent. That's a lot of people dying of sepsis. And if I could give them this cocktail and it decreases the mortality by any any amount whatsoever, given the cost and even even the vitamins trial shows that there were no side effects, guys. There were no side effects from this. I don't, I don't understand what's the big hubbub about about causing damage in the patient. There's no side effects. That's it. And the the four the four latest um the four latest, well, the two latest uh, steroids trials, being the, the adrenal trial <clears throat> and that second French study from 2018, both of those trials only showed that stressful steroids cause hyperglycemia. That's it. And we got insulin for that, guys. We got insulin for that. Um, so let me let me quickly pop up the data on, sorry, guys, as I come over here, because I had this open. So here's my problem with the study. And I know you've been watching me for a little while now, and I hope that the way that I manage sepsis gave you a little bit of uh, a little bit of insight uh, into the way I practice, and of course things I do on the side because everybody looks for holes in my arguments. I take care of the air airway, I do bedside echoes when necessary. I talk to the patient and family. I also manage other patients simultaneously. I mean, we are trained to be able to take care of numerous patients, but the things that we know make a difference in mortality already. That there's good data include early antibiotics and early source control. The other data that exists that's not so concrete, but it's leaning towards being in that direction is that early fluids are better than late fluids. So give your fluid resuscitation early and early vasopressors, early vasopressor administration is showing to be better as well. So again, my problems with the study. First of all, the time for the patients to get randomized being Whenever the patient showed up to the hospital or was in the wards until they reached the ICU. 
that time is not listed anywhere in the study. No, it's not listed. I can't find it. And if I if if I'm wrong, I'll take this video down. I'll make a new one. But I can't find that data. Then the time from ICU ICU admission, the time they hit the unit until they got randomized was 13.7 hours. That was the median time for the patient to get randomized. 13.7 hours. That's a long time, guys. 13.7 hours, that's half a day. That's from like, that's a whole entire shift to get randomized. I can't believe it took that long. It, it's, it's frustrating to me. And then on top of that, from the time that they got randomized until they received the study drug, that was 12.1 hours. So if you could do simple math, and again, I know we're talking about median times, but median times are median times. <laughs> they, it's a, a number that we don't know what it is, being the time from them being wherever they were until they got into the ICU to get randomized, which we don't know, plus 13.7 hours, plus 12.1 hours, which means that on um, median time, it took at least 25.8 hours over one whole day for them to receive the study drug. A lot of patients with septic shock die before that even before that time even comes. How could one expect for there to be a mortality difference or a difference in any of the other outcomes when in fact it took over a day to get the drugs? That's my problem with the study. And the reason why I'm very livid about that outcome is the fact that many people, and I already started hearing from yesterday after I placed, after I did my Instagram story where I said that I was going to keep on using the vitamin C, stressful steroids, and thiamine in my septic shock patients. Many clinicians are going to say this study shows that vitamin C, thiamine, and stressful steroids does not work. What the study does show is if you give it more than 24 hours after the patient's been in the ICU, then it does not work. That's what it shows. But it does not prove that it does not work. It does not do that. Even Paul Young said that on his interview, not on his interview, but on the when he was sitting on the couch after the, the data was presented. They acknowledge that this is a limitation in the study that it took forever to get that study drug into the patient. So what irks me about this is patients who could have potentially benefited from vitamin C from this cocktail are not going to benefit from it. They're not going to get it. Clinicians who just read the conclusions, who don't, who don't do the heavy lifting when it comes to reading journal articles, they are going to say, the trial doesn't work. It showed that there was no difference. I'm never going to use it. But it's, <laughs> and that's, well, there are no buts. That's just basically it. That's why I'm fired up about this study. And you can go ahead and criticize me all you want, but at the end of the day, I'm just trying to take care of patients. I'm trying to do the best I can, give every single patient a leg up. This is yet another study that shows that there are no side effects, which everybody's like, oh, there's gonna be side effects and the calcium oxalate, blah, 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 blah. No side effects, no side effects. The study says it itself, no side effects. So I'm not putting my patients in danger by giving them this, this, this cocktail. What I am doing is I'm trying to save their life. Criticize me as you want. That's what it is. I hope you guys enjoy this video, learn something from it, or if you're going to learn about how I take care of my patients at the bedside, I have plenty of uh, nurses and other physicians who I've worked with in the past who could vouch for my practice style that I do actually camp there and I check in on my patients very, very regularly to make sure my nurses and my patients, and when I say my nurses, I don't mean like my nurses in the possessive, I mean my nurses is in my teammates, okay? Because I can't do their job. Um, people look for any little hole in anything I say. It's, it's quite entertaining. I guess it comes with the territory. Um, I hope you all have a great day. I hope that you take something out of the study and I hope your patients do well, because that's what we're in here for. We're in this to take care of patients and save some lives. Thanks guys, bye.